Hi, I'm Jim Comey. I'm the director of the FBI. I'm Chuck Rosenberg. I run the Drug Enforcement Administration. We're talking to you today because we are facing a crisis, a crisis that is killing far too many people, prescription drug and heroin abuse. Each year, more than 46,000 people die from a drug overdose. That's more people than die from car accidents or from gun violence. And half of those 46,000 deaths are related to opioid abuse. We thought the best approach would be to let you hear the truth. No filter, no censors, just the straight facts from people who have lived with the hard consequences of opioid abuse. You're going to watch unscripted interviews that include some raw emotion and some profanity. You're going to witness real tragedy and learn what happens when drugs take hold of real people and don't let go. You will see that those whose lives are taken over by drug addiction are often kids from stable homes with strong families. Good people who had great childhoods, were given everything they wanted, and had everything going for them. But they took one wrong turn and they were hooked. And once you're hooked, it is so very hard to get off these drugs, and the spiral down is so quick. After you watch this film, we want you to talk about it. We want you to talk to your parents, to your relatives, to your friends, to your brothers and sisters. If you know somebody who's using drugs or even thinking about using drugs, say something. You're gonna see that once the addiction starts, it is often too late. By telling somebody, you could be saving a life. I didn't care, I didn't think about it, I just did it. Once we started getting high, it was done. She was 17 years old, and the only way I knew about it is because she was arrested. Started smoking pot around 18, and I was always offered prescription drugs, and I never would take them. Then I was in a car accident. I was running down in the middle of the night to get some water, fell down the stairs, landed on my back on the wooden floor. It started for me with pot and uh, just progressed into um, hell, basically. Weed didn't do it for me, but definitely weed started it all for me. It was definitely something I didn't see until it was too late. I had no clue what I was getting myself into, so. I started taking three at a time, and then I was taking four at a time, and then I started taking I like became six addicted at that a day. Time. When you're getting high, it's not just a drug. You're hooked. $500 going And to she dope. was a convicted felon at the age of 18. I had maggots in my leg. Turned to prostitution. Stealing from my family. Married, mother of three, and I'm tripping. They take you to hell and back. It's not just the little pill. It takes control of you. I started using heroin. The same heroin that just killed me. You can't go back and say I'm sorry. It will win. It will get you. Her sister found her. Died in her sleep. My daughter. She was dead. Being addicted to opiates is like chasing a dragon. You're constantly seeking that first high. But what's going to happen if you actually catch it? Come from a great family, you know, always had what I wanted. Um, never had a curfew. I could sleep over at my friend's house whenever. I could have done anything. They would have paid for me to go to any kind of school, stuff like that, and any kind of, uh, they paid for guitar lessons. I grew up uh, with my dad. My mom wasn't in my life, though. Um, he pretty much was mom and dad throughout the whole life. He would tutor me for at least an hour. On the weekends, we'd go out, we'd go camping, we'd go out on the boats. We always had something planned. She started in gymnastics when she was like a toddler, and she was a cheerleader through um, middle schools, high schools, and she was also a competitive cheerleader. She started competing probably in seventh grade. She was a very good student. She um, was in AP classes, AP honor roll. 
work myself up through the years uh, with minimal college to uh, a position I worked as a corporate account executive. I was making about an average of 122000 a year. Things were pretty, pretty good financially. We were secure. Kids were happy. We were, we had no real issues. Dad was military. Mom was Korean. Everyone I grew up with was the same way. Everyone's parents was military and Korean parents, <laughs> Korean mom. <laughs> no, I did martial arts, ballet, gymnastics. Did all kinds of stuff. I did piano lessons. I was an honor roll student. Always went to school. I was like 3.43, grade point average. I had a great childhood, um, great family. We did a lot of camping, um, a lot of fun stuff, going to the beach, camping at the beach. Very active in scouting, Boy Scouts, and something my father, me and him, did together. You know, a couple days uh, before my 18th birthday, I actually got my Eagle Scout, which was a big accomplishment for me. I met my first husband when I was very young. I was 13 and then we got married at 17, so I got to grow up pretty quick. I was 22 years old, and that's when everything started. I got pregnant with my youngest daughter. Once I had her, they gave me Oxycontins. That was the pain medicine. And from then on, that's where my addiction started. A friend offers you something at a party or at home, or you're having a bad day and, and uh, you, you need something to pick you up, so somebody hands you a, a pill and says, here, this will help you feel better. That's how this problem always starts. I was at a concert when I was 15 at the time, and I was drinking a beer, so I got a possession alcohol charge. I got put on probation, so and I couldn't smoke pot anymore. So I started to panic, and then somebody approached me and said, well, here, try this, and it was a Oxycontin 80. So I was hobbling into work, and a young lady that worked there used to be a pharmaceutical sales rep, and she had some samples of things. And she said, Katrina, have you gone to the doctor for this yet? And I said, no. So she said, well, I have these things. Take one. Not more than that, go home, take one, you know. And I had a habit every night where I'd go home and have a glass of wine. So I went home that night and I took what she gave me, but instead of taking one, I took two, because I didn't even know what they were. And took the two, had my glass of wine, and all of a sudden, it just triggered something in my brain. And it, I, I would say I became addicted that day. I think the new friends had a really, really big impact on, you know, when she got to that fork in the road, you go left or you go right, and I think at that point, the friends helped pick the road that she chose. This sounds really appealing. I'm gonna try that. But I guess what most people and most kids don't understand is, you know, when you try something, you're not trying it. It's your new path. I just like the I just like the feeling of certain things being high. It was not, it wasn't like um, I'm depressed. So I'm gonna take this to make me feel better. It was kind of like I'm feeling good. I'm gonna try this to see if I can feel even more better. Started taking three at a time, and then I was taking four at a time, and then I started taking like six at a time, and then I went from taking them orally to shooting them, and that was the end. I went back to the doctor a couple times and got him to refill the medicine to the amount that he couldn't refill it anymore. So then I started buying Oxycontin off the street. Um, from there, um, I, Oxycontin started to be more expensive and harder to find. A girlfriend of mine introduced me to heroin. I could get a whole lot more for a whole lot less. And then once I shot up the heroin, that was it from there. My addiction took off and my daughter was seven months old when I became a physically addicted to heroin intravenously. I 
I never hesitate to ask them all which drugs they've tried. And they'll typically say, I've tried, started off with marijuana, uh, tried cocaine, and I've tried oxycodone. And, and I ask them of all the drugs they've ever tried, what's the most addictive drug? And without a doubt, 100% of the time, they'll say the most addictive drug is oxycodone. You know, the drugs, you know, took, I feel like it took my mind over and made me do things that I, you know, normally brought up not to do, you know? And uh, it just turned me into a, a, a monster. You know, I just went in my medicine cabinet. My buddy's like, oh, hey, these will get you high. Let, let's do some. So I was like, OK, you know, you talk me into it. They're right here. I don't have to pay anything. Sure. It doesn't even have to be a drug dealer. It could be right in your house. And the next thing you know, you're, you're hooked. My friends in the beginning were the friends that didn't do anything. And then I met the crowd that did do stuff. You are who you hang out with. That is for sure. These kids go into it as, I'm just going to go to a party, and hey, they're doing this over here. Let me, you know, I want to fit in. Let me do it a little bit. And it, it's the devil. It, it gets you. It's, you know, it's, it's that temptation. Hey, this is a fun party over here. Mm -mm. It'll suck the life out of you. All I wanted to do, if it had been in front of my face, is do it. It's not just a little pill, <laughs> you know? Respect the power of that, you know, of that pill. It's, it's uh, just because it's a prescription, it is every bit is deadly and every bit is addictive. I worked at a daycare taking care of other people's kids. Um, I drove the daycare bus. I had to take their children to school. But before I could drive their kids to school, I was in the bathroom of the daycare crushing up pills, snorting them so I could go about my day. The whole time you're sitting there saying you're not a fucking addict, you're not addicted, guess what? You fucking are. Because why are you taking that hit saying, nah, dude, I can quit when I want? You know, you're, you're addicted. People are like, oh, I only smoke weed. I'm not addicted. It's natural. F whatever. Tell yourself, whatever. Oh, it's legal now. Oh, f off. You know, whatever. The first time somebody uses an opiate drug, the, the euphoria that they get is, is, is something that they continue to search for and seek for. So while you could do that in the beginning by just chewing on the drug, over time you can't get that high anymore. And so now you have to take it up to the next level. And nobody sets out uh, thinking that they're going to end up being a needle user. But every one of those needle users will tell you that uh, they couldn't get the high anymore doing it the way they were doing. Heroin became my best friend. Um, heroin became the love of my life. I put heroin before my family. I put heroin before my children. And I thought that I couldn't do nothing in life anymore without heroin. There's absolutely no difference between, in my mind, a heroin addict and a pill addict. We both will do anything to get it, break the law, do whatever. You're both addicted. You both go through the withdrawals. You both go, it, it's the exact, exact same thing. It's everywhere. It's in your cabinet somewhere. It could be in your grandparents' cabinet. It could be it's your friend's mom's cabinet. It could be anywhere. That's pills. But, well, heroin could be in a drawer somewhere. Who knows? It's, it's all the same. One's just prescribed to you, and one you go cop on the street. There's no way to say no with the opiates. It's hard. Real hard. I can tell myself no, 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 but my body, as soon as you think about it, you get anxiety, your palms start to sweat. You know, your, your, mental, your mental ignores your physical part of it. I am very angry. And one of the things I'm most angry about, and I tell her all the time, is that that drug was so much more important to you than me. And I'm the one that can help you. I'm the one that helps you. I'm the one that supports you. I'm the one that'll always be there for you. You need something, I'm gonna be the one to take care of it for you. But something that literally destroyed everything good within you was so much more appealing. Wanted that so much more than anything I could offer her. And I'm angry. I am angry about that. The 
progression of addiction and the behavior that, that comes with it is, is pretty um, standard, regardless of where you're born, how much money you have, um, how old you are, what your race is, what your nationality is. You can be the smartest person in the world. The minute that chemical hits your bloodstream, you lose control of what it does in your body. You can't control it. Nobody can control it. I don't care who you are. You, you, it's not controllable. I lived in um, crack houses. Uh, and it's almost like something you see on TV, an abandoned building with um, drug paraphernalia everywhere. It might be a, a piss-stained mattress, and God knows what else is on it. Um, there was actually a place in the city that we were at, and um, a lady had overdosed in the bathtub. She had died. She was still in the bathtub. We'll just find another room in the house. And that's what my day consisted of. It became my full-time job. The needle was my boss, a very demanding boss. Your whole day revolves around it. You go to sleep doing it, you wake up doing it. You know what I mean? It's like some people smoke after every meal they have. No, you're doing a fucking shot. It's a never-ending vicious cycle. It's the same thing over and over and over. You wake up, all you want to do is find out how you're going to get something, how you're going to get it. You know, it's kind of stupid if you think about it, because I'm wasting all this money stealing from my family and my friends just to do a drug and fall asleep, you know? And then I wake up sick, so I'm like, crap, now I gotta do it all over again, you know? You're still chasing that first high. So, you know, in order to be high, you gotta at least be normal. And to get there, you gotta at least do enough to where you're not sick anymore, so. Well, usually, like, if I had stuff the day before, I'd always save a bag for the morning time, so when I wake up, I could get well. And I call it that because in the end, I wasn't using to get high anymore. I was using to stay well, so I wasn't sick. You know, I'm not even getting high. I'm just trying to, you know, be able to get up out of bed. You know, my head was always on my lap, you know. I feel like I've missed a couple years of my life because there's a lot that, I mean, it's just a fog, black fog, because, you know, I'll, I really wasn't there, you know. My addiction level was so bad that I couldn't even function without 40 pills a day. I was ill. Like, literally every four hours, the chills started setting in. And I would wake up and I would be, I woke up sick. And that's the way it went all day long. How do you know you're an addict? It's when, you, when you're doing something that you know is not good for you, that's harming you, but you can't help yourself. When, you're, when, you're, when your relationships are starting to fall apart around you and you don't care and the only thing that's on your mind is about how to get the substance and how to get to the next high, you're an addict. You can't maintain an opiate addiction and a normal life for very long. I felt like after my first year of using it, I, caught, I actually got physically addicted to where I actually needed it to even to wake up and get out of bed, start moving around, take a shower. And that's when I started um, you know, stealing from my family, friends. You know, whatever money I had in my pocket was all going to it. If I got a $500 paycheck, $500 going to dope. Because you always tell yourself, whenever you're using drugs, and especially it's like a super addictive one, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not addicted. Motherfucker, you're addicted. You know what I mean? Like, you're fucking addicted. You're in denial. You know, you might not be addicted at that point in time, but you're going to keep fucking using, and, and a month later or two months later, you're fucking addicted. At one point, my husband said he would stop giving me, putting gas in the van so I could drive the distance to the city to get my drugs. And I said, well, I'll show you. I'm going to move to the city. So I don't need my van and I don't need gas money because the dope dealers are going to be living right here with me. And that's what I did. I ran away from home. You will be high and put yourself in situations that you will get hurt. Someone will take advantage of you. You know, you'll be knocked out, it's gonna happen. You're gonna get hurt. Some people who have money and they don't have to steal for it. And then you meet other people who, you know, just pawn their family's TV and, and it's coming to get high and then deal with the consequences later. She stole checks from her grandmother and signed them. 
She stole my debit card. If it wasn't nailed down, it was in the pawn shop. She spent $800 a week. My daughter, who had, you know, everything handed to her, you know, could have gone anywhere in the world, very book smart, you know, very motivated, worked at a strip club. My little girl degraded herself just to get that. Women turn to prostitution, which I've done myself. Um, guys will steal. They'll rob you right in front of you. I've seen guys take guns out on dealers and steal and rob everything from them, not even worrying about if they get shot or end up in jail. People get raped. People, people get killed over stupid shit. You know, it's, people, now I can say it's just a drug. But like, when you're getting high, it's not just a drug, you know? It's some The best thing that can happen to someone who's addicted to oxycodone is that they can be arrested. That's the best thing. The best thing that they can be arrested and go to jail. Everything other than that is worse. It's going to end in a bad way. You're going to get caught eventually, so I just didn't think it was going to be me. I would just think, you know, they, they must have screwed over the wrong person, you know, they got caught because they weren't careful enough. She was pulled over. I searched the car, and she had a quantity of pills. At that point, she was smoking them, so there was some type of a pipe device in them, so she was arrested. And she was a convicted felon at the age of 18. I have four kids. My youngest son will be one this month. I've been locked up for freaking eight months. First time I came to jail, the first time I got locked up this year, he was two weeks old, you know? Haven't, don't even know my kid. Uh, my other three are in foster care right now. Never, I never thought any of this would ever happen to me. The only thing I care about is my kids. Like, my kids are suffering. It's not me. I give two, two shits if I'm suffering. I mean, yeah, it sucks. But it's like, my kids, they, they didn't do anything in this. My parents, you know, they got to come visit me through, uh, I don't even get through a window. I get through a camera. They're a little camcorder. That sucks. It's not worth it. Losing your freedom sucks. You have somebody tell you when to get up, when to shower, when you eat, what you eat, and you got to worry about the other people that are in here, that are in here for, you know, life, and they don't care about you. I was supposed to go to court November 2011, and the judge was supposed to let me go. He gave me the maximum, which ended up being 23 months, two years, instead of the 10 months. And at the time, I was so angry. In retrospect, I'm very thankful because I would have, uh, I know for 100% certainty, I would have gone right back out and done it again. I got kicked out of my house, and I met your neighborhood friendly drug dealers who were like, oh, you can crash on this couch. And they, you know, of course, they'd give me stuff here and there, but it wasn't ever enough for me to even enjoy it. So that made me run fake prescriptions. You don't think about anything. You don't think about anybody you're hurting. You don't think about before and after. You don't think seven dudes in all black are running up in your house. You don't think you're going to be on the news. You don't think anything. You don't think any of that. Every generation seems to have their drug of choice. Unfortunately, this generation seems to have found prescription opiates as that drug of choice. And even more unfortunately, the consequences of those drugs are far more devastating than anything else we've seen in the past. Chemically and physiologically speaking, there's very little difference between oxycodone, morphine, and heroin. It's just that one comes in a prescription bottle and another one comes in a in a plastic bag. In the beginning, I would always try and get pills because you know what you're getting, you know? You know it's always gonna be the same thing. And then eventually that just got too expensive, you know? So then you'd go for heroin because it's cheaper, but you take that risk of getting really good stuff and overdosing or getting fake stuff or just stuff that isn't good enough to even get you well. 
a lot of my friends were trying heroin, you know, to kind to get the same high from the oxycotton, and it was cheaper. And so I, of course, I got into it, and um, it just, yeah, it just grabbed me, it just grabbed me, you know. I can tell you this, that I think she was able to access heroin, more heroin, easily than the pills. When she was using one or using the other, she was the same horrible, difficult person. I always said that I would never touch heroin ever in my life, and it was prescription drugs that led me to try heroin. Prescription drugs are the same thing. It's an opiate. You can get four shots for the price of one pill, and it's a dirty drug, because you never know what you're going to get. People can cut it with something that can kill you, you know? That's how most people overdose, is that it's cut with something bad. Um, the doctor asked me, he said, um, where are you getting your heroin from? Where, you know, and I said, I'm, I'll never tell you who I'm getting it from. He said, I don't want to know from who. He said, I want to know from where. And he said, well, let me tell you what you're shooting up. He said, you're shooting ha scramble heroin, and, and it's, they are using meat tenderizer as a cutting agent. And it's not like, you know, a bag of heroin comes with ingredients on the back. And of course, you trust your drug dealer that he's going to just, you know, keep you coming back to him. But he claims he didn't know either. That's how he got it. But yeah, so it eats everything away underneath. Uh, in here, they shoot a meat tenderizer. And they have, like, big blue black marks. I'm like, what the f is that? I'm like, oh, that's meat tenderizer. You've got a few of them. What do you mean? You didn't learn? You don't know. You don't learn, because they're trying to get high. It doesn't matter. A lot of my friends um, have had abscesses. They might get a staph infection, which turns into MRSA or, you know, hep C. And, you know, if that's your only needle, that's your only needle. So you're going to use it again. At one point, I had an um, abscess in my leg. That was so bad. Um, it, I had staph infection. So my leg was like four times its normal size. Um, when the doctors cut my leg open to clean it out, um, I had maggots in my leg. They were eating the, the rot, the infection. That wasn't enough for me to quit. Um, as I was admitted to the hospital, they gave me a pick line, which is a an IV line. Um, I had the dope dealer come into the hospital and shooting heroin into my IV line. I have contracted um, hepatitis C from sharing needles with people that I don't know who. I shot up toilet water because I didn't want to spend any money to go buy a bottle of water. So we would stop at public restrooms and use toilet water to mix with it to shoot it up rainwater on the side of the road and we'd suck it up in the needle and shoot our dope. I didn't care what it was going to do to me later on, just I wanted what it, the feeling of it right then and there. Withdrawal for the individuals that are taking the heroin that's available now looks like extraordinary um, physical um, muscular pain. And very few people can actually manage it. Like, you know how when your whole body hurts when you have the flu? And like, just, it's like 15 times worse than that. <laughs> Opiates, you're getting sick. I don't know who the f you think you are if you think you're stronger than some dope, because you're not. You know what I mean? Your body's gonna give in, your mind's gonna give in, your judgment's gonna give in, you're gonna bow. And uh, that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's the way it is. That withdrawal is a You feel like you just wanna die when you're going through that. At that point, you're willing to do anything to get that next high so you can just feel normal. I mean, I remember her in her room crying and just busting her room up, screaming to me, just get me a little. Just get me a little so I can stop. No. No. It feels like your skin's crawling and you can't sit still and you just, you'll do anything to make it stop. 
You can't move. You constantly sneeze. Your fucking whole body fucking aches. It fucking hurts. People are crapping on themselves. People are puking on themselves. People are doing both at the same time. You, you would probably rather be dead than have to actually go through a withdrawal. It was horrific. I was uh, sitting on the toilet, diarrhea, vomiting on the floor, so weak I couldn't even, couldn't even move. I just lay there like, I don't want to eat, drink, nothing. It's just something that I never ever want to experience again. It is the worst feeling ever. And I wouldn't even, um, I wouldn't wish that feeling upon my worst enemy. That's how bad it is. Every day I come to work knowing that somebody died. And more times than not, we have at least one um, prescription drug or uh, other substance abuse case. Your friends, your family will find you dead and then what happens? And then that is the image that they get stuck with for the rest of their lives. I've lost several friends to um, heroin and prescription pill overdose. I know two people on a personal level that had died from it. You know, one time my friend, she got out of here. She got high. She wasn't even out six days. She was dead. One of my friends, she took her normal dose and OD'd. Her sister found her with a needle in her arm in her room, which was not good. Uh, the day that I overdosed, um, I was having a hard time finding a vein, and a girlfriend of mine said, well, just go in your neck. You have your jugular vein. And I said, OK. It didn't let me push all the heroin in, and instantly it killed me. When the ambulance got there, they, um, they gave me a shot of Narcane, and I was non-responsive to the Narcane, which is adrenaline, and that's to you know jumpstart your heart. And, they, and it didn't work. Um, so they had to use the defibrillator, and that's where they shock your heart back. They got a pulse. Um, they got me to the hospital, and I was still kind of in and out of it. Um, but when I came to, and I unhooked the IV to the, uh, from the pole and unhooked all these little things they had on me, and I went and walked right out and got in my van. And I showed up to the, to the dope dealer with the gown on, these things stuck all over me, the IV in my arm. And he sold me heroin, the same heroin that just killed me. I utilized the IV a couple times before I turned it back in. I'm such, I, I have nowhere really to shoot, so that was a freebie. So everything came to a head. I was writing the prescriptions and full on with my addiction. And I ended up uh, getting caught and going to jail. And while I was in jail, my daughter got involved with some friends. From what I understand, her friends were all doing prescription pills. I had no idea. I didn't even know it was a problem. I just thought it was my problem. and. Um, she said, Mom, you don't have any right to talk. Look at you. Look where you are. I said, but Kirsten, you saw where it put me. I can't imagine you would do the very same thing that I did. I was like, how? You know, it just didn't make sense. every time with her. Well, I told her I'd go in for her. And usually it works because she'll go in for me and ask for my prescriptions and they give it to her. And so I went in there and I asked and um, next thing you know, she got arrested and then she called me saying that I had a warrant for me. I said, why would you make me go in and do that? Like to your own daughter, knowing that she can get caught and get in trouble. And she said that she was sorry because that she didn't realize how bad her addiction was. You need help, Kirsten. When I talked to her, she didn't even say goodbye. She must have nodded off the phone because I heard like a, uh, and that was it. It was um, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. Um, I was in the jail, and they came down and, and told me they needed to see me. And I went up, and um, because her father and I were both arrested for the same thing, we were both there, so I saw him coming. 
And the detectives came and told us that she, you know, what had happened, and the parent overdose, and that she was, uh, initially they said she'd passed, and then they said she was in ICU, struggling for life. And they wanted me to, you know, talk to the doctor, and the doctor recommended I disconnect all life support, and I refused. And then um, they had seven resuscitation efforts, I guess, and eventually, you know, that morning she passed away. So. At her funeral, most all the kids were high. Death is real. And I will say, because I remember being that teenager too, so I know it's like they're gonna mock it, but it's real. And once, I mean, I think I'm still in shock. Like, I, it, it, it is hard. I don't even know how to put it into words. Um, maybe that's why I'm able to deal with it because it's so mind-numbing that someone you love that much, she was my first love. Someone you love that much, you can lose like that, and you can't go back and say I'm sorry or set a better example or talk them out of it, you know? And I know she didn't want to go. I know that's not what she wanted. <laughs> I know that um, she had, you know, all these things that she wanted to do, and I know that um, as they resuscitated her through the night, that was her way of clinging to life, you know? But it was too much. I love my children more than anything in the world. I will walk through fire for them. And I know a lot of parents feel that way. But you can't feel that way. You have to understand what you're dealing with is not your child. I put my own child in jail to stop her from this. And that's not an easy decision to make. It's not a fun decision. Nobody wants to know that they're, you know, their little girl sitting in, in jail. But she was seven months clean, eating healthy, getting her rest, no drugs. My my son, my nephew, my mother and I went to get her. And she came out and just, she was healthy. Everything was great. Everything was great. There were no problems, no fighting, no talking about, you know, mom, I'm feeling, I'm feeling funny. You know, I need to go to a meeting. Nothing. Everything was just that little girl at 16 before all this stuff started. That's who she was. And then just, um, she uh, asked to go to the store to get a pack of cigarettes. And she came home, said, oh, you know, Mom, I'm sorry I was late. You know, they didn't have my cigarettes. I had to go to another gas station. OK, you know, and things fine. So I'm cooking dinner. And I'm like, you want to help me cook? She's like, no, I don't want to help you cook. You know, she said, so I'm going to go in my room and watch TV. You know, and she was so bubbly, you know, like, like nothing. Nothing was wrong. And she went upstairs, and it was maybe 40 minutes. I was cooking dinner. Dinner was done. And I'm hollering for the kids. My son and nephew come down, and Sierra didn't come down. I think she fell asleep or something. So I go upstairs and knocking and knocking and knocking on the door. There's no answer. I open that door, and my little girl is on the floor dead. <laughs> And I remember when I pushed on her chest, I heard that last breath. I heard the <sighs> I was in my kitchen cooking dinner. And that happened 17 steps up. And I had no idea, no idea that when she left this house, that was going to happen. And. I spend my Sundays looking at a gray headstone in a patch of grass. I will be spending my Christmases there, her birthdays there, all my holidays. Because she took that wrong turn. My girlfriend, Sierra, you know, she, uh, she passed away a year ago this month and uh, from heroin. And, you know, that's a constant big reminder in my head that, uh, 
You know, if, if I even pick this stuff up once, it's gonna kill me, you know? And uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her. And, uh, you know, not a morning that I wake up, I don't wish that she was laying next, beside me, you know? She was my best friend. We went to high school together. Um, oh, sorry. I met her in uh, high school. Uh, I'm sorry. And I just miss her a lot. I know she was just doing it here with me. Sarah came home on February 12th. Sierra died February 18th. When she got out, it's still calling her. It's still calling her. It's that powerful that you could spend seven months clean, clean, and being educated on nothing but how to beat it, how bad it is for you, you know, all this. And you last six days. spiral down is so fast, you know? It doesn't take much. And I lost everything. I lost my daughter, first and foremost, but I lost pictures, every material possession I had. I had never been in trouble in my life. I'm now a felon at 41 years old. So all that work I did, you know, all those dreams I had, you know, it's like I'm starting over again with a huge weight on my shoulders, you know, all for a pill. My dad doesn't even trust me anymore, which is hard because my dad's always trusted me my whole life. I've never had my dad look at me with disappointment before I did this. I'm, I'm a criminal, I'm an addict. That's how everybody will always perceive me. Listen to what they say, say no. Just say no. And you're not uncool for saying no. You're more cool for saying no, I think. I wish I could have said no. If I could go back and do it all over, I would definitely go back and say no. I didn't feel like I was physically hooked, but that's because I never gave it a chance to stop. You know, and I didn't really learn how to enjoy life without drugs. As much as I wanted to quit, I was too scared to ask for help. I don't want to freak my parents out by telling them I'm hooked on some hardcore drug. It didn't kill me like everyone's gonna, you know, everyone told me. It's not worth it, and it will get you. You're no different than anybody else. It will, it will destroy your life. You will end up in a jail, you'll end up dead, or you'll be in some crazy institution for the rest of your life. And that's serious, and that's for real. And it took me coming in to jail and being incarcerated, and it took me missing my mom's funeral, missing my children grow up. It's taken all of this because nobody in their right mind would turn their back on their dying mom for a drug. I want to be that loving and caring mom that my mom was to me, to my girls. I don't want them to hate me, to resent me. I don't want them to be embarrassed by me anymore. If you want to fail the rest of your life, if you want to be in and out of jail, if you want to possibly lose everything that matters to you, go ahead and go get high. Go ahead. If uh, you want to be happy, you want to freaking 
get married, like every good part of my life, I wasn't getting high, you know? Every good part of my life, I was getting high. And any drug addict will tell you that. If you want to be a flunky, go ahead and get high. Go ahead and do it. But uh, I've been there, done that, and I wouldn't recommend it. Sierra did not take life for granted until she started using. It is much stronger than you, and it will win. It will win. Because this doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody in your family for the rest of their lives. That we're the ones stuck here, missing you. And there's help out there. You gotta take it. Don't think you can do it alone, because you can. And your parents aren't the enemy. They just want the best for you. It's something I want to do with for the rest of my life. Um, you know, to be honest, I actually just I, uh, relapsed about a month ago and uh, used for about a month and I have a, a week, I had a week clean on Wednesday. And you know, that's something that just shows how, just how powerful this disease is. For me to lose somebody a, a year ago, not even a year ago, but I'm already using it. That's how powerful this stuff is. And, uh, I'm just try, gonna try my best to stick with it because I know it will kill me. And, uh, and uh, just something I gotta work at every day. It'll take you to hell and back, and if you're lucky, you know, you'll make it back, you know. It's just not worth it at all, you know. If, if, I, would, if I could go back, if I knew what I knew now about this, and if I could go back, I, I would do it all different. Starting with that first pill, I wouldn't touch it. 